Welcome everyone, I'm Spiro, thanks for tuning in. As we find ourselves in this new normal, uh, we have seen long-standing agendas, which have remained behind the scenes, hidden away from the public, now being offered as solutions justified by this crisis. The World Economic Forum's Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution are perfect examples of this. Today, we will dive deeper into this agenda and also focus on how it may reshape our lives if the technocrats have their way. Now, joining me today is John Kleisik, who is an adjunct professor uh, with a master's in English who has taught college rhetoric and research argumentations for eight years. His literary scholarship concentrates on the history of global eugenics and Aldous Huxley's dystopic novel, Brave New World. He is the author of the book, School World Order, The Technocratic Globalization of Corporatized Education. John Kleisick is a contributor to the Activist Post, Counter Markets, Center for Research on Globalization, and many, many others, including DavidIke.com. He is also the director of writing and editing at Black Freighter Productions Books. He holds a black belt in classical Taekwondo and is a certified kickboxing instructor under the International Muay Thai Boxing Association. John Classic, thanks so much for taking the time to be my guest. Thanks for having me, Spiro. Honored to be here. Now, uh, the social engineers have for generations used the strategy of indoctrination to target society's most impressionable minds, our children, through many ways, but primarily through our education systems. Now, in addition to your fantastic book, which I have yet to read, but I've been hearing uh, people raving about it, uh, you know, like Richie Allen, when you were on with his show, that's when I first became aware of you. Now, uh, you also have a new article out, which is currently available in the Counter Markets newsletter that focuses on uh, the technocrats' plan to reshape the education system and therefore basically reshape the future of humanity. Now, your article is titled Cradle to Career, COVID Lockdown Has Accelerated the Path to AI Learning and the Technocratic Workforce. Now, lots of important information in this article, and it starts out how in 1982, a special advisor to the Department of Education's Office of Research and Improvement blew the whistle on Project BEST. Now, can you explain to us what Project BEST is? Is it still active today? And why did this special advisor to the Department of Education blow the whistle on it? Okay, so Project BEST is uh, it's an acronym. B-E-S-T stands for Better Education Skills Through Technology. Uh, it was part of Reagan's private sector initiative, uh, and basically, it planned to use public-private partnerships to basically merge the uh, government with the corporate sector using what back then was called the Skinner Box technology. Uh, and so it's basically based on uh, BF Skinner's adaptive learning uh, or operant conditioning, uh, st stimulus response conditioning. Okay, so those are all acronyms that basically mean the same thing. Uh, and why Charlotte uh, Charlotte Thompson Iserbeet is the person who uh, blew the whistle. She wrote the deliberate dumbing down of America. Uh, and basically, you know, when she brought it up to the, de the department, she basically said, hey, this sounds like uh, corporate fascism to me. And they basically said, well, we don't we didn't really think about it like that, Charlotte. Uh, and then the other part was that, you know, on top of or, or built into that uh, fascistic apparatus was going to be basically you're going to change classical education. So you're going to change education from the art of learning uh, and you're going to change it to a science, to a science of psychological conditioning that will be facilitated by big technology companies. Uh, and so she basically saw this as not in line with, you know, uh, the, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution and uh, human rights and things like that. Now, we've seen throughout history, uh, great change typically follows a great crisis, as we have seen played out many times, uh, the Hegelian dialectic of problem, reaction, solution. Now, it seems we are witnessing many solutions being rolled out uh, in response to this crisis. What are some of the examples of how the education system will be you know, reshaped uh, in response to this crisis? Okay, so... Um Basically, what we're going to see is the next phase of Project Best being rolled out, okay? Uh, and so one of the simplest ways you can see that is through something called uh, the new distance learning uh, regulations, the federal regulations. So the, the specific rules are, uh, the, the code is 85FR18638. Basically, what this is going to do is deregulate the rules for what they call distance learning. That means online learning or virtual learning. OK. And so uh, once upon a time, uh, you had to have particular certificate to teach online. Um, 
So what they did right away when they went on lockdown, they said everybody's got to teach. They got to convert their classes online. Well, a lot of people didn't have those certs. So they basically uh, relaxed the, uh, the rules for that. Uh, but also, if you take a look at that, uh, those federal regulations, you'll see in, the, in those clauses three particular agendas. OK, so one is called co- competency based education. Uh, another is called direct instruction. And then another is called uh, the is the adaptive learning software, OK, which they refer to as artificial intelligence. OK, uh, so basically the three of them all together means this. Uh, instead of a human teacher needing to actually provide the, the feedback, you can have the AI do that with the adaptive learning algorithms. They can provide the direct instruction and it can be on a competency based process. So what that means is instead of there being a semester long process by which you have to complete so much material, usually it's 16 weeks, but you know, they've got all these different flex blocks and and, uh, summer classes that are truncated. Uh, What it means is let's say the student uh, wants to move faster or slower. Well, then the student only has to learn a certain amount of competency at a certain pace, which means you don't have to actually facilitate it in a classroom. You can do it on a subscription basis through these technology companies. Okay, so basically uh, the DeVos department has deregulated the oversight on uh, distance learning. And basically what that's gonna do is facilitate all of the big technology companies that came out of Project Best uh, to basically plug in the Skinner Box software, okay? so. Again, B.F. Skinner, he came up with his stuff. Uh, his, his theory of conditioning was called operant conditioning. It's, it's just another mode of st- older stimulus response conditioning. If you take that theory and you plug it into to the digital computers, it's what we have is the adaptive learning software. OK, uh, the companies that are facilitating it, one of the biggest ones would be K-12 Inc. OK, so if you go back to who set up Project Best, it would have been Secretary of Education T.H. Bell. The next year, he hands off the the uh, the project to Secretary Bill Bennett. Bill Bennett is the person that set up K-12 Inc. K-12 Inc. was also funded by Betsy DeVos. Um, and then you have Betsy DeVos meeting privately with Peter Thiel, who funds adaptive learning software, in particular Newton and Clever. Uh, and Peter Thiel was also the speechwriter for Bill Bennett. OK, so you got all the people that basically set up Project Best are hanging out together and they're going to basically get a windfall of federal dollars through this, uh, not just through the CARES Act, but by deregulating the rules so that they can get more CARES uh, stimulus money. So that's that's basically how uh, the current situation, the current Hegelian dialectic, uh, you know, Naomi Klein has a has a big article. It's called the Screen New Deal. Uh, you know, um, don't exactly agree with her her ideas about the contact tracing, but she, she gets it right on basically how they're going to use tech uh, and surveillance capitalism through something called disaster capitalism, okay, which is which builds on this thing called creative destruction and disruptive technology. So basically, right, they're using this disaster of the COVID crisis uh, to, you know, problem, reaction, solution, uh, get all their companies to get a windfall of this, this money, and, um, and that's where we're at. Well, this is very concerning. Uh, we know that big tech in general uh, has uh, probably far more influence over our lives right now uh, than most people will even be aware of or acknowledge or even think about. You know, uh, you know, for example, Google basically has a lot of influence on shaping your perception of reality because people always say, oh, let's just Google it. And so whatever, however they set up their algorithms can affect what kind of information you're getting. And then now this... AI and these tech companies are moving into the schools, which, you know, I want to get into a little bit more here. But basically, we know that big tech Silicon Valley technocrats are involved. And I just have to ask, uh, is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation involved? Because it seems what no matter what rock you look under, you find Bill and Melinda Gates. Yeah, and in my book, they're in basically every chapter. And, uh, you know, when I first started talking about the book, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates have been doing, uh, <laughs> I've been doing things like this for a long time, right? So it was kind of like old hat. I wanted to focus on like Neuralink, which I think we'll talk about later, and some of the newer companies. So I, so I didn't really mention Gates a lot. And then after COVID, I'm like, okay, so, so I need to start, you know, referencing Gates again and not just 
not just what's going down now, but, you know, my website has 66 uh, Gates Foundation grants that were put up before COVID. Okay, since COVID, there's, uh, I looked at 203 grants. I looked at more than 203, but there was 203 in which uh, there was a, over a quarter billion dollars of Gates Foundation money spent out uh, for a range of different educational um, assistance during COVID crisis. And that ranged from everything from the adaptive learning software to other big data mining projects, workforce training projects, uh, but also uh, funding universities to help with COVID research and vaccine development. So I included those as well because it's, it's part of the public private uh, edu corporate ap apparatus. Um, so, you know, the, the, the Gates Foundation, uh, they set up something called the Reimagined Education, uh, got a lot of pushback on it. And so you don't really hear a lot about it in the mainstream press. So I figured the best way that anybody's gonna figure out what exactly that is, is to dig through those those grants, which is, which is what I did. Um, so interesting thing is first that <clears throat> uh, the Reimagined Education Project it uses the same language as one of the CARES Act competitions. So the CARES Act wants to hand out money, not just for the adaptive learning software, which automates the teaching with AI, but it also wants to give you money through uh, a competition called Reimagining Workforce Preparation. So for, uh, for what's, what's geared towards the, the stimulus response, is that conditioning is geared not necessarily towards academic learning, but towards what job they want to put you in, right? So, so your school is now an engine of corporate training or workforce training for uh, big companies with big tech on top. Okay, so they're using the same language here uh, to pump basically the, the, the same agendas, workforce training through, um, through, through the adaptive learning software. Okay, so what did I what did I pick up when I dug into the actual Gates Foundation grants? Uh, well, first thing I should mention is that right, the, the New York partnership is this right. It has uh, Governor Cuomo, Eric Schmidt sitting on the, the is the chair of the the Blue Ribbon Commission, and then it's getting some partnership money with the Gates Foundation. Okay, so those are your three key players. So if you dig around in the Gates Foundation grants you can see some money going out to uh, an institution called Innovate EDU. Innovate EDU is a New York based nonprofit. Innovate EDU is setting up uh, basically an app, a network that will allow schools to aggregate all their data into something, all their Google Classroom data into something called BigQuery. Uh, and so basically what you have is a partnership with, with a New York based nonprofit, uh, the Google Corporation, funded by the Gates Foundation. Now, what, what does this database look like? Well, basically it looks like something uh, that is now defunct. It's called InBloom. Okay, InBloom um, was basically, uh, it had contracts with, Am with an Amazon cloud that was ran on a server by News Corp. Uh, and basically it, it wanted to, to put all the, the student data into this one cloud. And people were like, whoa, okay, that looks, you know, that's, that seems a little uh, too much data aggregation. So they, so you know, they got a bunch of pushback, lawsuits, and stuff like that. Uh, by the way, that was also funded by the Gates Foundation. Okay, uh, and then later they came up with something called LearnSphere. And LearnSphere was like, well, it's it's not in Bloom. It's like in Bloom, but we don't put it all in one database. It's distributed, and you can kind of, you know, there's some firewalls in there, and there's some some uh, negotiation about who gets access to what data, but it's largely built on the same process. And the, the uh, originator, uh, Ked, Kenny Kettinger at uh, Carnegie Mellon will basically tell you it's, it's essentially the same idea. Okay. Uh, and so what's the idea there? Well, as I mentioned, as I documented in my book, it's basically to develop AI. Okay. Uh, and so it's basically, they're going to take all that data, all the, all the student data, all the teaching data, all the learning data, all that cognitive behavioral data, and also what they call socio-emotional learning data. Okay, so the students thinking algorithms and the students feeling algorithms, they're going to take all that data and they're going to use it not just to develop better ed tech products, so better uh, adaptive learning software and things like that, but also to develop basically uh, down the line, 
uh, AGI or artificial general intelligence. So to develop, you know, uh, basically an artificial consciousness, something that because the, the adaptive learning software, which is based on Skinnerian stimulus response algorithms, right, it's super sophisticated, but it only does that. OK, it can't decide to, you know, one day get up and, you know, stop doing that or it can't extrapolate out into other algorithms, right, uh, natural language, et cetera. Uh, and so they want to take all of basically the student and teaching learning data through the developmental stages and use that to, to, to run through their AI uh, algorithms, right? And I, sh I should note that, um, you know, the, those federal regulations or deregulations of which IBM uh, has, a, has a member sitting on one of the, on the chair, uh, basically they say that they can't keep up with the AI deregulation or the AI evolution fast enough. So what they're going to, there's a clause in there that basically says we don't have to give you prior approval to uh, push the new algorithm forward. Okay. So they, so they've already created the loopholes where basically they can take this data and crunch it for whatever, you know, advances in technology they, they want to use. So that's, that's the core of how the Gates Foundation uh, is involved in in this uh, disaster capitalist Hegelian dialectic. They, there's also, uh, I should mention that the, the Innovate EDU uses the, the language as well of reimagining education, and they also use the language of disrupting education or using disruptive technologies. Okay, and so that comes out of this philosopher Joseph Schumpeter, who basically said that you could, uh, the economic boom bust cycles could be manipulated. Or that basically they would they would you know like a Hegelian dialectic, um, uh, be pushed forward through these new technologies that would remove the old uh, industry or the old labor force and replace it with something else. Uh, and so uh, they the Gates Foundation funds the the disruptive uh, institute or Clayton Christensen Institute for Disruptive Technology. So again, right, they're dumping money into all of this stuff. It's using the same language. It's all the key players involved. Um, and I should just mention one more thing is that, you know, there's there's also a reimagining policing movement now as well. OK, which, you know, at the end of this dialectic is going to be a bunch of stuff like databases, facial recognition cameras through something called community oriented policing. And I actually before all this stuff went down, I wrote an article for activist post called Socio Emotional Thought Crimes in American Schools, where I talked about how the, the racial disparities in discipline in schools would be used similarly to the racial disparities in policing to set up a new data tracking system in which, right, the algorithms will decide who gets what punishments, um, and they're already using them for no cash bail, or that would that will be what becomes no cash bail. They're already using them to sentence people, uh, and so instead of basically pr providing money, it'll just be they're going to look at your payment histories, your work history, education, they'll look at all that data and say, how much of a risk are you? This will be the new policing system that plugs into all the rest of it. Uh, and it's basically social credit. Yes, exactly. Exactly. The social credit. As, as you know, the uh, World Economic Forum did come out recently and announced basically, uh, you know, this great reset. And, and then you go back, they say it's going to include the fourth industrial revolution and you go back and look at their own uh, words on the fourth industrial revolution and they're talking about building a new construct you know a new social contract um, and that's going to be tied into these these smart cities and I mean this you know agenda 21 and I mean it, it's it's unbelievable to see this actually rolling out and when you're talking about these AI algorithms being introduced into these schools and essentially how big tech and the technocrats are taking over education if they haven't already um, to shape reshape education and uh, you know how children like basically the AI is going to be teaching these kids to fill positions in in the new uh, uh, technocratic you know uh, dictatorship era that we're moving into and which is unbelievable this is extremely uh important information and it's happening i don't think many people are aware of it that it's happening i mean it's rolling out right now these programs are in the works right now and this crisis is being used to justify the implementation of these long-standing agendas now um, i wanted to ask you specifically about elon musk you know, a lot of people really like him. They think he's so cool, and he's like, uh, he goes on Joe Rogan's show and smokes pot, smokes weed, you know, and, you know, initially, he was warning against 
AI and how it's a threat to hum- humanity, just like Stephen Hawking was before he passed away. But now M- Elon Musk says, basically, if you can't beat him, join him. He did a complete 180, and I want to get your take on, on why the flip-flop. Why, why did Now he is endorsing uh, this, this Neuralink project, or running it, essentially, um, and he's announcing next month that there's going to be in August uh, a major announcement in regards to the Neuralink project, which wants to implant microchips into people's heads and connect them to AI. And, and he's launching a network of satellites to blanket the Earth with 5G, which is going to be part of the, the operating system it's, of this new uh, fourth industrial revolution is going to be 5G and AI. But like, why the flip flop uh, with, with Elon Musk and, and what's his whole deal? That's a good question. I like the way you posed it because one of my solutions is, you know, to bring back classical learning and one of the basic principles of classical learning, which, which believe it or not, it's not taught anymore, is the principle of non-contradiction. So you don't have to have all kinds of degrees and fancy this or that to understand when someone contradicts themselves, right? I mean, you only need to track, you know, you said this A, you said this B, those two things are opposite. It can't both exist. So, right, what's underneath that? Uh, you know, I, you know, I mean, it could be that maybe he was sincere and, you know, uh, was doing his best to, you know, argue or, you know, send the message that he was uh, that, that we need to stop AI. And then maybe everybody just went along with it anyway. So then he then he came up with his neural link to, you know, as the second solution, because, hey, you know, if you can't beat it, then I guess, you know, you should try to adapt to it. Um, but, you know, then again, you know, as, as you point out, then, then why build it in, in the first place, right? And, you know, uh, uh, you know, he's setting up his, his space fence and things like that, um, you know, and he's out of the PayPal mafia. I mean, so, you know, he's, he's he comes from a group of people that uh, made their money on data extraction, basically, uh, you know. And, uh, you know, I mean, he might make green cars or or things like that. But like you mentioned with the Agenda 21 stuff, you know, that's not we're all going back to, you know, farming and and living like indigenous people. Like that means like, you know, all that stuff's going to be reserved for for mass production and you're going to be in a smart city uh, on social credit and your neural link will, you know, so you don't have to carry them. Uh, 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 you know, a, a face face shield around. Of course, I guess we're halfway there already, right? You got the face mask and some people with the, <laughs> the face shields, you know. Uh, but that's, you know, that's essentially what it'll be, you know. And, and so I... Um, I think it's a I think it's a PR game, I guess, you know, rhetorical ploy. Make it... May you gotta have somebody that maybe seems like they're uh, pushing back against it in, in the seat, you know. I, I guess that's what I would say, yeah. That makes sense, especially when you see, you know, uh, Musk uh, kind of pushing back against the lockdowns, you know, oh, and the lockdowns and everything like that. And people praise him for it. And they're like, yes, he's standing against the system of control, but he's helping to build this system of control. And it's specifically the technologies which will be utilized by it. Uh, John, you have done brilliant work exposing the technocratic transhumanist agenda. Uh, where do you see this going? Like, is this inevitable that man will be merged with machines as the World Economic Forum says they will be and how they're going to get access to our thoughts and get access to our emotions and how they're going to have to build a safe construct for us to be able to operate and think in? And, you know, like Elon Musk says, if you can't beat them, join it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's certainly... I mean, I, 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 you know, uh, Ed Opperman asked me about a month before the COVID stuff, like how long this was out. And, you know, I was like, eh, they say singularity is like 2035, 2045, somewhere in that range-ish. Uh, and, you know, so I was going by those numbers. And like you say, you know, like we're like at the point with, you know, I just contact tracing. I've said it many times is the beginning of social credit because they're basically going to they're going to take your they want to blur your bio health records uh, with basically, you know, your employment records. And, you know, and at the schools, they're talking, you know, they're talking about uh, taking taking your temperatures and things. Well, uh, you know, where is that data go after you take it? And so does it get sent to some contact tracing database? And, and then so is there law enforcement involved that needs to check up on these people? So, so now you've merged criminal justice, healthcare, education, 
workforce all into one database. And that's basically, if anybody wants to see what it looks like, that's social credit. Just take a look at what it looks like in China. There's been several documentaries. I mean, to see the facial recognition and, and all that stuff, to, to actually see them walking around, it, it's one thing to talk about it. Uh, I mean, that part looks like we're... we're, we're <laughs> We're pretty much there. I mean, I, I, I like to think that, you know, we still I mean, we still have rights regardless of what what system they build. I mean, but it's up to it's up to you and I to to exercise that. And, you know, some of that might require you to, you know, part ways with a job or something like that. If, you know, you don't want to go along with whatever their particular new regulations are. I mean, what what's happening right now, which I've noticed it, some of the places where I work is, you know, people with, with, with good intentions, they, they just, you know, they want to plug in all the software because we're stuck here. So, you know, I mean, that's we got to do something for the kids and then we don't want anybody to get sick. So, but, you know, I'm not seeing anybody asking questions about what are we doing with this data? Where is it going? How does this, does this apply? Uh, does, does this violate HIPAA? Does this violate FERPA? Does it violate other, um, you know, criminal justice uh, restrictions? Like, is it inevitable? I don't believe that. I can't believe that. I believe in, uh, you know, I believe in a higher power and all that type of stuff. And, and you know, I believe that history has got us going, going somewhere. I don't think it's got us going nowhere, you know, just to crash and burn. So I, it might, it probably will get a lot worse <laughs> before before anybody starts to to you know maybe turn the boat around but i don't think that all at any moment in time we just have you know all you have to do is not not use the technology not act i mean there's all kinds of ways to find uh, other avenues to you know to be a human being and to, but so but again that, i mean that you have to you have to make a decision then because you know i mean it's gonna make you're gonna have to part with with some of these some of these things you know, so and, uh, you know, I mean, definitely people, I always believe, and I'm not trying to tell people what to do, uh, obviously, it's people are individuals and it's there to choose for themselves. But, you know, people, I believe that everyone, and the more people that do it, the better, but everyone needs to resist tyranny in all its forms and not just keep your mouth shut and go along because uh, it'll go away and get better. You know, it's this is a slippery slope that is, I believe, uh, they're conditioning us for the next phases, for the next stages. They're they're softening us up with some of these mandates and requirements right now under this new normal system uh, that is eventually, like you said, John, uh, going to encompass every aspect of our life, and it's all going to be digitalized and and probably in some form of biometric, if not implanted into us you know people think that it's crazy oh you know if you if you know you talk about uh you know the vaccines and stuff and if you're a crazy anti-vaxxer and and you know but they are, are literally talking about putting microchips this is elon musk not through a vaccine but putting microchips in people's brains to connect them to artificial intelligence and you think that these uh technocrats won't use this technology to benefit themselves or try to manipulate manipulate you or control you so we i've covered some of this before i know you've done fantastic work on this uh, are there any uh, final points that you'd like to make or anything that we may have missed that you'd like to mention uh, just because you mentioned it, I, 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 I like to say this, you know, so to tie all that together, look, if they can mandate you to get a vaccine in order to go back to work or to public or to participate in the public sphere, and they've set the legal precedent that they can put stuff in your body for the purposes of regulating public health. Now, when they change policing to algorithms and mental health uh, professionals, and the social worker comes up and they use the DSM-4 instead of the Bill of Rights to say that you're mentally ill, well, they'll give you a neural link chip that'll go ahead and, and modify your algorithms in your brain to make them mentally healthy for the better good of the public health. And they'll be able to do that because it's okay to put alter your biology for the sake of the greater good. So... Uh, no, it's not crazy, and all the stuff is getting set up right now. And to tie back into education, don't think that this that if a student, you know, is writing on their digital module and they have opinions that they think is mentally unhealthy, that that might not go into any of those databases. And so, no, it's not crazy. Uh, but but again, you know, if we could start with, I really mean this. This is sincere. It seems so subtle, but the principle of non-contradiction, because the stuff they want us to do right now, they're contradicting themselves constantly on the masks, on the efficacy of the tests, 
uh, on on how they calculate the deaths. Okay, you don't have to be an, a scientist. You don't have to have an authoritative expertise to say you said this, then you said that. They don't go together. It can't be. It's got to be one or the other. And at this point, you've demonstrated that you're not reliable. So now I'm going to make up my own decision. So that's that's what I would like to leave on. It, well said, absolutely well said, and uh, you know this is what, part of the reason why I have been myself pr- pushing back uh, so heavily on on the masks and and on that issue because, you know, it's it's starts with masks. What's next? You know, what's next? So in in in, in the name of the the greater good, uh, the public health, they're trying to justify it, trying to shame you into it, have others shame shame you into it. And uh, you know, don't don't fall for the trap. Of course, I'm always respectful of others, especially if I'm out in public or whatever. I'm I'm not trying to be a jerk about it. But hey, you know what? My immune system's doing just fine. There's a lot of information out there that uh, shows that they're not as you know not effective. And, and there are a lot of studies. Anyways, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But you know, just essentially, you know, it starts with masks. Next, what vaccines and then Neuralink microchips. I mean. I know that sounds crazy, but this is the road we are heading down. And if you do the research, and Mr. John Kleisick, you have done the research. You've written the book on it. Uh, Fantastic having you on today. Definitely, I'd like to thank all of the viewers out there who watch and share these reports. And I would certainly like to thank uh, Mr. John Kleisick for being my guest today. And uh, I will be sure to leave links for uh, your site, which is uh, uh, schoolworldorder.info, where you can find John Kleisick's book. And uh, I'll also leave a link for the Counter Markets newsletter, July edition. Uh, and that has this recent article in there that's extremely important, especially if you do have kids and you know they are going back into the public school system. This is some information you need to be aware about. And you can get that, uh, uh, that newsletter for free by signing up right now at Counter Markets. Uh, I'm Spiro for ActivistPost.com. Thanks so much for watching.